Hey there, I am back home from Adepticon and my voice is almost recovered. Uh, but today for you guys, I have my demo slash walkthrough of Star Wars Shatterpoint to be able to show you all. I unfortunately didn't think to bring a second person and camera to help get some additional action shots, certain close-ups and stuff like that, so I just have the one fixed camera, but I will at least be able to put up the photos of the relevant cards and abilities so you can further get an idea of how things look and play. Before I send you to the walkthrough, I want to go ahead and say that this video is going to feel more like a walkthrough than a traditional demo. There isn't any major decision points for me to choose other than really just getting to roll some dice. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I wanted to set the expectation ahead of time. And with only four demo boards, AMG definitely needed to streamline and script the demo experience so that anyone who wanted to get a demo in had the chance to do so this past weekend. So, with that said, here is Will Schick walking me through a lot of the core functions of this awesome new game. So, we're going to go through a demo of Star Wars Shatterpoint. The goal of the demo is not necessarily for you guys to play the game, but what we're going to do is effectively I'm going to show you how all the core mechanics work. We're going to roll some cool dice and we're kind of going to work through things just to see how everything integrates in to the overall game experience. So Star Wars Shatterpoint is a game of dynamic skirmish Star Wars battles. Uh, in Star Wars Shatterpoint, it's really trying to evoke the experience of like the Saturday morning animated classic, uh, the chaos and kind of the pandemonium in there. So if you imagine like if uh, in any Star Wars media, you have the bigger battles that go on and then you have the more zoomed in like personal yeah. conflicts, we're in that zoomed in personal conflict state. So at this point, the plan has been thrown out the window. Everything's kind of gone like cattywampus. And our heroes are doing their best to, to reclaim victory from what seems to be the jaws of defeat. Uh, the name of the game itself kind of gives you an overall idea of what we're trying to, to get out of the game, what you can expect from the gameplay experience. And that is Shatter Points. So Shatter Points, if you're not familiar with them in Star Wars like kind of lore, are these moments in history or time where the actions of an individual or a group of individuals can dramatically shift the course of history. Um, so the, the whole thing that you're going to see here is that there's a lot of fate, there's a lot of chance, and it's up to you as the players to take those moments of, the, of key importance and make the best out of them that you can in order to seize victory and to further your own goals. So you are playing out your own shatter points. Um, in shatter point, players play strike teams against each other. A strike team is simply two squads that have been combined together to create the overall strike team. So you'll see here we're playing with the core set. Um, we have the squad of As um, Asajj Ventress with her B1 battle droids and Kalani alongside Lord Maul and his Ma uh, Mandalorian Super Commandos and Gar Saxon. And they're all squaring off against Ahsoka Tano with Bo Katan and some Clan Kree's Mandalorians and Anakin Skywalker along with Cal Clone Captain Rex and his 501st Clone Troopers. Um, in Shatterpoint, you can mix and match good guys and bad guys as you wish. Um, when you build a squad, which we're not really going to go super deep into here, but effectively it's very simple. You have to choose a primary unit, a supporting unit, and a secondary unit. Your primary unit details a lot of things like what era the squad can be from, how many points you get for your secondary and supporting characters, and all that information is listed on the back. Um, in the core set itself, you have a lot of opportunities to mix and match, so you can kind of build the squads of your dream. You could take one squad like you could take the Ahsoka squad and put it with the Maul squad and maximize your Mandalorian-ness. You could mix up the different supporting units, all that good stuff. So there's a lot of opportunity to create your own Star Wars uh, dream squad and dream team or to play with a more thematic and canonical squad that kind of replicates what you loved out of the different shows and movies. That said, um, you're going to hear the term unit and character a lot. So what is a unit? A unit is basically a stat card worth of things. So everything in Shatterpoint that you'll utilize is called a unit. A character is an individual miniature. So each unit uh, is going to have a certain number of characters in it, and that's going to be denoted based on this little guy icon here on the back of your cards. So you'll see that Lord Maul or Anakin Skywalker is a primary unit of one. So you know that there is one miniature in that unit. If you compare that to, say, the Mandalorian Super Commandos, or the 501st Clone Troopers, you'll see that there is a supporting unit and there are two of them in it. So that means that there are going to be two 
miniatures that make up that unit to characters. Abilities in Shatterpoint will reference unit or characters. If something references the unit, it affects every character in the unit. If it references a character, it only affects that specific miniature. So pretty simple. When it comes to uh, units that have multiple characters in it, those characters act, act independently. So there's no kind of unit coherency. There's no requirement that they have to be within a certain range of each other. If you want, your Mandalorians can literally be here and here on the table. The only thing that units do is they share damage, they share status effects, and they share actions. So when you say this Mandalorian is going to move, the other Mandalorian character in that unit also has to take a move action. Whether it moves or not, it's using its action for that. So they share actions um, among themselves as well as a lot of other things. So that kind of wraps up the difference between units and characters. How does a unit function? Units are composed of three, basically three cards. You have your unit stack card. This is the card that tells you the unit's name. It has the different abilities for the unit. It has the unit's stamina and its durability, as well as all of its tags. Uh, we'll dive into these as we start playing the game and kind of explain how all these things function in play, because it's a lot easier to see that and more exciting than me just droning on about it. Um, the second card is going to be the stance card. Every character has its own unique stance card. The stance card is the combat capabilities of the unit. So this determines its attack dice, its defense dice, and both ranged and melee attacks. It also has its expertise charts, which is kind of how skilled it is when using certain weapons that it, that it possesses. And it has its combat tree. And the combat tree is kind of the meat and potatoes of Shatterpoint combat. Um, we wanted combat to really evoke the, dyna the dynamism and excitement that we see in duels and different fights, those close-in fights on Star Wars media. So more than just every success equals damage, we wanted to see characters like pushing each other around as they, bat as they batted each other back and defended and repost. Um, seeing characters utilize their powers to jump and reposition after making a slurry of attacks. All these different things. And between these two cards, the, the stat card and the stance card, we're really able to dive into that, that micro view of what a character is and bring their personality fully onto the table. And we're able to do this because Shatterpoint focuses on, you know, a maximum of like eight different miniatures. So you can get a lot more into the specifics and the character and the feel of these things, um, as opposed to other games which might have a more macro view. Uh, the last card that every unit has is going to be in that stack here. So if we flip over one of these, these are the order cards. So. Uh, we talked a little bit about how shatter points are these random chance events where fate comes along and it's up to the characters themselves to make the right choices or to affect a major breaking point in history that's going to change everything. In shatter point, we kind of represent part of this by the fact that you as the player have very little control over your activation orders. So every care or every unit in your strike team has an order card. You take all of those cards along with a special card called the shatter point card. Uh, which is a wild card that we'll talk about in the demo when it pops up. Uh, and you shuffle them all up, and then you place them into your order stack, and that will determine your activation orders for the game. When you run out of cards in your order stack, you simply reshuffle them all together, and you continue play accordingly. There are no rounds or like cleanup phases in Shatterpoint. You simply start the game, you continue the game till it's over, and uh, have a great time and reset for the next one. How do you win a game of Shatterpoint? So Shatterpoint is all about uh, missions and objective-oriented like scoring. Uh, every player will bring a mission pack to the game, and the mission pack that every player will have from their core set is called Shifting Priorities. There's a card here that says how you lay out the map, and it also includes any of the special rules for um, the mission itself. So in Shifting Priorities, it has a special rule where in Struggles 2 and 3, there is a priority token that moves about the different objectives randomly. If you can control that objective on your turn, you score two points instead of one. So you're going to start chasing the uh, shifting priority, and that's why it's called shifting priorities, obviously, because what you want to do is kind of like chase the rabbit. There are uh, three phases, because Shatterpoint, in order to win, you have to win two of the three struggles, is what they're called. Um, they're broken down into phase one, two, and three cards. Before the game and deployment happens, the player whose mission pack is being used randomly draws one of the cards from each of the different phases. So there are multiple cards in each phase, which means that you never really know which cards you're going to get. You stack them accordingly, so three goes on the bottom, two, and then one. 
And this determines the uh, struggle objective layouts that you'll have throughout the game. Once you've set up your mission, you place your miniatures and deploy like we've done here, and then you simply flip over the top card of your mission deck, and we see that we have Steal the Secret Plans. So you orientate that card towards the player that won the first player role. We're going to assume that the Galactic Republic player over here won first player. Huzzah! We then see that we have these active dots here. These are going to be the active objectives of the round. So all of the uh, objective tokens are objectives, but only the ones that are turned on are going to be able to be scored for this struggle. So these objectives are now active. These are the ones you're going to be fighting over. When this struggle ends, these objectives will turn off. The scoreboard will reset. We will flip over the next card and we will turn on those objectives. Nothing else on the table will change. So wounds, where characters are positioned, status conditions, all that will remain the same. So you're, you're kind of having to adapt again to a shifting dynamic on the battlefield. You know what you have to do at the moment, but you also know that it's going to change once the struggle is won. And it's up to you as the player to kind of determine tactically, do I want to continue to fight to win the struggle? Do I want to try to position myself to be better off to start the next struggle? And those things go. The player who wins the struggle takes the struggle card. Whenever a player has won two struggles, they win the game. Um, the way that you determine who wins the struggle is by using the struggle tracker right here. These black cubes are called momentum tokens. So these effectively start to fill up the struggle tracker as the game goes along. So it's very tactile and fun. Um, this cube right here is called the struggle uh, tracker, and it's going to move back and forth as players score points. So think of it kind of like a tug of war. On the end of every player's turn, they're going to determine which active objectives they control, and then for each active objective they control, they're going to score victory points for it. So for instance, if uh, our um, dark side player over here had two active objectives at the end of their turn that they controlled, they would score one, two points. If at the end of our Republic player's turn, they controlled three objective points, they would score three points, one, two, three. So you're going to go back and forth like that tug of warring until somebody finally pulls that token to wherever their momentum track is, to the end of their rope. At that point, they've won the struggle and the game continues. We'll talk about how you can gain additional momentum tokens to fill up your track as we play the game. But in general, that is how uh, overall you're going to win the struggles and then the game of Shatterpoint. So that's stuff all in place. Let's go ahead and dive in and start playing. The last thing that I want to talk about before we do that is the force pools. So obviously the will of the force is a super big thing in Star Wars. It's an energy field that surrounds and binds every living thing in the galaxy. And what's really important to note about the force is that it actually has an influence. It has kind of a will. It wants events to unfold in certain ways. And it also like compels and affects individuals even if they're not able to sense its presence or control it. Um, think of it like kind of like the sixth sense, you know, the thing that tells you to move left instead of right to avoid the bus that's coming at you, those kinds of things. It's not, it's not represented in this game like Anakin Skywalker can use the force to jump like a, like a huge massive leap. The force he uses in the game to do that is not necessarily the force that he's manipulating to jump. Instead, it's the force kind of willing him to make the right move at the right time. And you as the player are in control of this. And you're going to see that most of the abilities in the game have a force cost. So it's up to you to manage this limited resource in order to get the maximum use out of your units and to use their various abilities to win the struggle and then overall the match. Um, as force is expended, you don't get it back until you move all the way through your order deck. So every time you reshuffle your order deck, you do get to refresh all of your force. There are other things in the game, uh, like uh, character abilities and such, that might allow you to refresh force that you've spent before. So you can utilize those as well, but the primary way in which you're going to get your force back is by reshuffling that order deck. Alright, so with that set up, let's go ahead and start our game. We're going to go ahead and start with our Republic player who won the first turn. We're going to flip over the top card of our order deck. It's going to be... And we're going to see it's Anakin Skywalker. All right. Awesome. So, normally this would be really great, but at the start of the game, Anakin Skywalker, who doesn't really have a ranged attack and doesn't have anybody to go charge with his lightsaber, probably not the one you want to spend right away. Kind of sad, right? Because if yeah. you used him, uh, it would be that whole deck until you got to use him again, minus your wild card, which we'll talk about. So I mentioned how Shatterpoint is really built on like the fate and random chance mechanics, but you as the player do get a couple of ways that you can manipulate this system. And the primary way that everybody can do it is they can spend one force 
to replace a card that they just flipped in reserve. And so when you place a card in reserve, you place it into your reserve pool. The reserved card is not played. You flip over the top card of your deck, yes? Aha! And you now have to activate this card that you flipped. It's important to note that once you have a card in reserve, you can't put another card in reserve. So your card, your reserve is now full until you use Anakin. At the start of any of your turns, you can choose to not flip a card, but play the card that you have in reserve. So now that you've reserved Anakin, the cool thing about it is that you have complete control over when he goes, because you can choose at the start of any of your turns to play Anakin. Nice. Once you play him and your reserve is then clear, you can absolutely play another card into that reserve. So it's not a one use only, it's as long as the reserve is clear, you can use one force, which is the cost to place a card in reserve. Okay, so the 501st Clone Troopers are gonna be our active unit. So when a, when a unit activates, it gets to do two actions. Actions in Shatterpoint are move, attack, and those are the two primary ones that you're gonna to wanna to use the most. And then there are three other actions that are situationally useful. There's focus. Focus gives you an additional die on your next attack. So it's a way to boost either your ranged or melee attacks. There are certain rules like um, impact and sharpshooter that have a number associated with them. So when you focus, you gain an additional bonus of dice equal to the number next to it. Uh, so for example, like Gar Saxon, if he can focus, he can take aim with his sniper rifle and he actually gains three additional dice instead of one because he has sharpshooter two. Uh, there is take cover. Take cover allows you to basically make a push move of one inch and then you gain a hunker token. A unit with a hunker token or any number of hunker tokens gains one additional defense die against range attacks for each hunker token it has. So you can stack that effect. Cool. It also stacks with cover if you have it. And the last one that you have is recover. So recover action allows the character to heal one point of damage from itself or remove one special condition from itself or from an allied uh, character within range two of it. So you can actually help your friends with it as well. Awesome. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start, though, by doing our best to take these couple of points here with the 501st Clone Troopers. So Absolutely. remember, they don't have to move or stay within any kind of range of each other, so that's really easy. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do a move action. Cool. When a character or miniature in Shatterpoint moves, you take the movement tool, and every character in Shatterpoint moves the exact same amount when it makes a move action. This is the advanced tool, and you place it with the cup touching the base of the miniature. You then pick up the miniature. You can bend the widget as well if you want to, if you have to go around the corner or whatever. Um, you then pick up the miniature and you place it touching anywhere on the tool. So this is legal placement, this is legal placement, this is legal placement, this is legal placement. As long as the miniature's base touches the tool in some way, it's a legal placement. When you are moving with an advance, there are a couple of things that you cannot do. You cannot place your movement in such a way that you end on an elevation that is higher than you. Okay. And how do you determine elevation is really simple. You take the range two tool and anything that is higher than the range two from the bottom of your base is at a higher elevation. So you'll notice that all of the terrain in Shatterpoint has been cleverly made so that it is at a higher elevation. Gasp. Gasp. I know. You fiend. Um, so with that in mind, if our clone trooper was, say, right here, and you wanted to climb, you wanted to get up here, even though you have the distance on an advance to do that, this is actually illegal because you can't place it over a higher elevation. But I have grappling hooks. But you have, you do not have grappling hooks. <laughs> they are not on your car. Um, please stop lying. <laughs> so in order to traverse elevation, you can choose to do a climb action instead of a normal advance. That uses the short movement tool, and it allows you to go up any amount of elevation that you want. Uh, alternatively, you can use what are called ingress points. So you'll notice we have these fancy ladders around. These ladders are our ingress points. Now, on your tables at home, you can have ingress points be like ropes, they can be elevators, they can be pretty much stairs. They can be anything that you determine allows miniatures or characters able, like the ability to traverse up and down terrain. Um, when you want to use an ingress point, at any point during a character's movement, if it ends its movement, or during a character's activation, if it ends its movement within range one of an ingress point, you can place it within range one at the top of the ingress point. Um, so this allows characters to quickly move up and down terrain as long as they have an ingress point. So ladder placement or ingress point placement becomes really important and can change the entire layout and availability of the battlefield. 
There are also different movement abilities that you'll see on the cards that we'll talk about that also allow you to move up and down terrain. That's the big thing. Uh, what can you move through and what can't you move through? In Shatterpoint, characters can always move through other characters, friendly and allied. You can't end on another character. You have to have room for your base. What about enemy? You said friendly and allied. Oh, friendly and enemy, sorry. Cool, just want to make sure. Enemy. Uh, you can move through anything like that. And then uh, the, uh, the things you can't move through are pretty simple. So normally that's going to be terrain stuff. And the way that terrain works in Shatterpoint is uh, it works exactly like you think it should work. And it has rules that govern that. And you can read the rules when the rules come out. But effectively, every, every piece of terrain in Shatterpoint has a couple of different distinctions. So there's, can you move through it? Can you not? Can you see through it? Can you not? So for example, these big thick buildings right here that you know you can't move through and you can't see through, can't move through them, can't see through them. These gantries right here that you know you can move through because you can do this, uh, you can move through them. And because they're graded, we determine that you can see through them. So you can draw a line of sight through these and you can move through them and everything works just like you think it would. Cool. And you'll determine what of those uh, attributes you're going to assign to each of your different pieces of terrain based on your table and your setup. So with that said, now that we've kind of determined all of this, let's go ahead and uh, move both of your clone troopers and go ahead and try to get one to each of the objective points. Absolutely. So clone number one, we're going to move, we're going to get within... Yep. So you'll end within one, so then you'll get to place within one. So we'll hop up here. And then I have to... Do I continue doing his stuff or do I nope. do his stuff next? So you next? do... You, you finish each action before you move to the next action. So okay. you'll have to finish the first action with this clone. All right. So All he'll right. hop up that way. In order to control an objective, you have to have the most uh, characters within range two of it, which is three inches. So we can see that you're just out here and you're just out here. Yep. There's a couple of ways we could solve this, but the way I think we're going to do it is we're going to show off an ability right now, and we're going to do defensive maneuver. Cool. So let's talk about the different types of, uh, of abilities that we have in the game. There are three basic types. There's active abilities. These are abilities that can only be used during the unit's activation. Those are denoted with the arrow pointing down. There are reactive abilities. This is the circle arrows. Reactive abilities always have a trigger, so the, the rule itself will tell you when it can be used. A lot of times that'll be like, if this unit is attacked, um, if this unit ends its movement within range of another allied character of this type, those kinds of things. Active and reactive abilities always cost force. The way that you can tell what their cost is, is you'll see a little icon afterwards. If there's no icon like coordinated fire here, the cost is zero but it still has a cost of zero. And that's gonna be important when we start talking about damage and wounds. But we'll get to that in a second. And the last one is gonna be innate abilities. Innate abilities are always on and they don't cost force. There are two subtypes of innate abilities. There are tactics, which we will get to in a moment, and there are identities. Um, both of those work exactly the same as innate abilities, but they just have slightly different rules that govern them, so they're called out differently. Cool. Quick question. Yes. Because it looks like there is something after coordinated fire. Is that a cost? Is that a... So this this symbol right here is simply telling you coordinated fire always gives out a certain condition cool. or like uh, status. And so this is kind of a quick to know that it, this is part of the title. So it's coordinated fire strain, basically. Okay. So it's a shorthand, basically. Yep. Awesome. Um, okay. So we're going to use defensive maneuver. So go ahead and... So we're going to spend a force point. Yep. And Which then, is sad, but... Each character in this unit may dash, and dashing uses the dash tool, which is the short tool. Cool. Uh, and this is a normal movement, so you can... Can I do bendy bend and it. all that? Yep. You can bend it. It follows the same rules as advanced, so you can't, you can't use it to go up or down elevation. Um, but otherwise, you know, you can move just like normal. And then we'll get, we'll get tactical. Yeah, I like it. Get, get those boxes to give us at least a little bit of very sad cover. All right. So, uh, and then after, if any of the characters dash, the unit gains a hunker token. So we'll give you a hunker token. So that's going to give you plus one defense die. And then because uh, we don't really have anything else to do on our turn since we're now controlling stuff, we'll go ahead and do a take cover action. Cool. And that will give us another hunker token. Awesome. So we'll have all the hunker tokens in the world. And with that, the clone trooper's activation is going to be over, so we'll put their card into our discard pile, and it, we will now check for control. So we know that we're within range three of this one, we're within range three of this one, 
We're going to range through this one. Three inches or range So three? range two. Range two, cool. Three inches, range two. I'll do that a lot. It's just all good. Me. I just want to make sure. Yep. <laughs> so we're going to mark these with nice little blue control tokens to show Because we're the good guys. You have taken control of it. Your cards are blue. His cards are red. It's very easy. Normally, after checking for control, you would score points. Yeah. However, because you took the very first turn of the game, you don't get scored. I don't care about it. Want... Okay, fine. Uh, and that's kind of the, the offset for getting to take the first turn is that you don't immediately get to start scoring. Uh, so the second player will have the first opportunity to score. All right, so with this in mind, let's go ahead and we'll have our dark side player. Uh, go ahead and flip their card. So we have Kalani. So notice that Kalani has this fancy little symbol here. This is the tactic symbol. So remember we talked a little bit about how there are special innate abilities. One is called a tactic ability. Tactic abilities always happen at the start of the unit's activation. And that's why they have a different title. And also why we have the little reminder icon here. So we look at Kalani's card, we see that he has the tactic Roger Roger. And it says at the start of this character's activation, all battle droid supporting characters within range four of him get to advance short. Um, so they get to dash, basically. So our two, we only have two battle droids supporting characters, which are our B1s. So you're gonna get to make a dash with each one of them. And this movement will allow you to go up uh, ingress points because it is a move. So. Get within range one. It's much bigger yep. base too. Yep. Yep. So you get a lot more movement out of them, and then you can place within range one. So we can go, can go further, can even we? further. Yep. And then the other B1 unit will get to do the same thing because the tactic says each battle droid character. So I would say go, go ahead and right have them go so. after him. And I'm guessing uh, while he's moving that he couldn't then descend the stairs off of Because the, it's a place, no. And not a, and and not a move. movement. Yep. Got it. Cool. Now, you can end a movement and use a ladder to go down, though. So you can get extra distance by going down just as much as you can going up by yep. placing within range one. But yes, you can't pop up and then immediately go down because you're placing and not moving. Makes sense. Um, all right, so our Roger Roger tactic is done. It's now Kalani's actual turn to go. So we want Kalani to go ahead and utilize that E5 blaster rifle that he's really good with and shoot a clone trooper. Um, so you have a couple of options. You could go after this clone trooper up here, or you could go after that clone trooper over there. And it's really up to you which way you'd like to go. Um, well, my, I think we should go for the one well, you were going to say you got So my overall suggestion yeah. is that the high ground is really important in this game. That's what I was thinking. And the reason that it's important is for a couple of reasons. One. Anybody who's at a lower elevation than you, typically will, you'll always get cover against because whatever you're on is going to provide you cover because the shot will go through it. Additionally, uh, being on a higher elevation lets you ignore cover from things that are below you. Okay. So uh, you could negate the, cl the cover this clone would get from his boxes if you were up high because right. you can basically shoot over the boxes. Um, so with that said, you know, moving to here I and then popping up. We might as well do that. So we can easily make that. Yep. And if we get within distance of one, so right about there. Yep. Okay, so that's our movement. So now let's go ahead and have Kalani make an attack. Um, we'll go ahead and attack this clone right here because we don't like him. He looks silly. Uh, when you make an attack, ranged or melee, it has to be within the range of the attack. Now, ranged attacks, you can tell. Uh, what their range is based on the number underneath their range box. So every stance card has the range attack and defenses and the melee attack and defenses. If you have a ranged attack to make, you'll see a ranged icon underneath with a number that tells you which range ruler you're going to use okay. to measure your range. The white uh, triangle is the attack dice that you roll. So if you're making an attack, that's how many attack dice you roll. The blue uh, square underneath that is the defense dice, so that's how many defense dice you roll when you're making it when you're being attacked by that type. So we see that Kalani has range five. He's going to roll seven attack dice. Clearly, in we're clearly in range, so we're going to pick up seven attack dice. Boop. Oh, I get to roll those. My favorite. Piece. Now, before you roll those, we're going to check Kalani's card really quick. We're going to see that he has this rule called target concentrate all firepower. Yes. 
And this basically says that there's another battle droid character that is within range four. Oh, we got the guys right next to him. Yep. And it is... All right. So, reading that really quick. When an allied battle droid character makes an attack, if the targeted character is within range four of one or more other allied battle droid characters, the attacking character gets to roll one dice, and you are within range four. So you'll get one extra die because you have a battle droid character attacking within range four of another battle droid character. So you'll get eight dice. So eight dice. Let's Good. Roll the dice. We're Woo. Over now. That's all right. Ladders fall over all the time. We're not worried about it. So let's talk about the dice results really quick. So we have critical results. There's one of these on each die for attack. Critical results are successes, and they can't be canceled by blocks. So they're the most bestest result you can possibly get. Uh, there are three strikes on each die. Strikes are successes that can be canceled by blocks. There are expertise results, and expertise we'll talk about here in a moment, but basically what you do is you total up the number of expertise you roll, and then you check your expertise chart for the weapon you're using, and those will modify your roll in some way. Typically, they give you more results. And then there are failures. Failures are nothing. They're not successes. They're just sad misses. Um, some abilities will interact with failures, and so it's important to kind of pay attention to those. So we have our roll here. We're going to do our modification now by using our expertise. Mm -hmm. So we look at our expertise. We have one. We go to our E5 blaster rifle. We see that our expertise at one says we get a crit. Nice. So we're going to add a crit to the roll. It's a lot of successes. It is. And now you're going to roll your defense dice. All right, so I've got five base. Yep, and you're going to get one per hunker, hunker token. token. So I'm up to seven so defense. Seven. All right, so we got a lot of expertise. We have two blocks and five expertise. Uh, I max out at three, but it's going to give me two so additional blocks. Two additional blocks. So we have a total of four blocks. Look at our four blocks. You can only cancel you can only cancel strikes, so you're only going to get rid of two of those. So we're going to go four down our chart on Kalani. Now, unlike in most games where successes just translate specifically straight to damage, we talked about the combat tree is what really dictates what happens when a character makes an attack. So looking at Kalani here, when you do a combat tree, you always start from the left and you move to the right. The orange boxes basically are there to identify where you start. Some character stances do have multiple options for where to start. Most, and then other characters just have one. So Kalani here has one. So we're going to see here, these two little icons are damage. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start by putting two damage in the pool. And because you do these one at a time, when you assign damage in Shatterpoint, you don't place them on the character as you go. Instead, you place them into a damage pool. And then once the attack is concluded, all the damage goes onto the character. So we have two damage. We then have a shove and one damage. So we'll put another damage in the pool, and we'll talk about shove. The shoves are really good results because, what? Time. What about time? How much time? Oh, we've got one more to go. Um, so shoves allow you to basically push a character, range one, one inch, effectively, away from your character. Boop. And then you can choose to follow up by pushing yourself one inch. Um, you don't have to choose to do the follow-up if you don't want to, so it just kind of depends on what your situation is. Uh, and then we go to this one. So this icon is really cool because this is an active ability icon. So this means that after the attack is resolved, you can use one of your active abilities for free. Oh, wow. um, You're going to get one extra damage, and then your tree is going to branch. So because you got four, you now have three options that you can do. You can do a disarm. Disarm is a special condition that goes on the unit, and it says the next time it would attack, it can't use its expertise chart. And two damage. You can do a reposition. Reposition allows you to make a full advance, ignoring the penalties for being engaged, and we'll talk about that when we get to engagement. Um, and you could deal one damage. Or you could expose him, which exposes a special condition that says you can't use your expertise chart on defense the first time you're attacked. And you could do two damage. So I think because you want to take this point, we'll your, the middle your best here, bet yeah, is to do the reposition. So you can just go ahead and move within range of that. Right about here. And we'll put one more damage in the pool for a total of five damage. Ouch. We'll put five damage on the clone troopers. And now you'll get to use your active ability. So we're going to use our tactile network ability. This would normally cost us one force, but we're going to get to do it for free. Tactile Network says that you get to choose an allied battle droid character within range four. Which we are still in. 
they get to make a short dash move. Right down the gantry there. And then they get to make a five dice attack, or they can choose to hunker and remove the status condition. But we want to do the attack, because the attack's the best. So we look really quick at the battle droids' attacks. We see that they're range five. Yes. They get seven dice, but they'll get one extra because you still get concentrate all firepower because Kalani's a battle droid, they're a battle droid. So go ahead and roll eight attack dice again. And you will still get all of your bonuses for uh, your defense. So now this does say that it make a five dice attack. So yeah, oh, sorry. So you'll make five dice, but you get one extra because okay. of concentrate all firepower. So it's six. There we go. We got uh, a couple strikes. Perfect. Four strikes, a critical, and one failure. All right. All right. So we'll roll over here. We have two expertise. Three expertise. Three expertise. So I got one hiding. And one block. So we look at our three expertise result, which is two, two blocks. Two. So I'll block four total. So block four total. So we get the one crit. So one crit stays in. And we see that what that does one damage. So one damage. Uh, so let's just say, for sake of demoing experiences, that the hand of the force came in and we got two crits. No! So with two crits, we would wind up doing two more damage. Yep. At two damage, that would equal our clone trooper's seven stamina. Mm -hmm. Once a unit has taken damage equal to its stamina, it becomes wounded. Oh no! So a wounded unit can no longer contest objectives, so they don't, they don't stop you from controlling it anymore. Um, and when you're engaged with them, they can't slow you down. They don't in inflict a penalty to your movement. Um, otherwise, they still can be targeted by attacks. They can still benefit from abilities from other characters. They can move, all that good stuff. At the start of a wounded character's next activation, so the next time their card comes up, they flip their, wounded to their wound tokens over to injury tokens, clear all their damage off them, and then they get to go again. Now, the big thing with wounds is not only do they stop you from being able to contest objectives, but for every wound or injury token you have, your active and reactive abilities cost one additional force. Oh. Mm. So defensive maneuver now for these clone troopers is going to cost two force instead of one. Using coordinated fire, which was zero, is now going to cost them one. So dealing damage and wounds to your opponent really impacts their ability to be able to utilize their abilities to their best effect. All right, Kalani is done, so we'll check for control really quick. We, we have that one. that one, and it looks like we still have that one. So we'll flip this one over. We'll put this one out. And then we will score one, two, and that will be the end. All right, so let's go ahead and have Anakin get some revenge on some battle droids. I feel like I need it. So uh, Anakin will go ahead and activate from reserve. Anakin does not have a tactic. So for... Just because I've been reading, mm -hmm. would I get to use Fierce Protector? You would, actually, because you got injured. So we if we're wanting to show about, stuff off. Yeah, we can go ahead and talk about identities really quick. So identities are special innate abilities that every primary unit has. Fierce Protector on Ahsoka triggers whenever an enemy character wounds an allied unit. So when you wound an allied unit, uh, you suffer some consequences. <laughs> Ahsoka Tano gets to make a full advance. So she could zippity zap over to here. Uh, Which that would be would put ingress. Her within that, so she could go one up here. Boop. And then that would put her within range here. So now we can actually skip the Anakin thing. We'll just show a melee attack with Ahsoka Tano, and that'll be perfect. Here we go. Um, if she ends within engagement of the character that made the attack, she gets to make a melee attack herself against it. Five dice. And using five dice. Uh, so we got three hits and two expertise. Okay. And Kalani's defense Looks is like it's three. three. Yep. Attack, so, we so we got one. Oh, yep. We're going to roll three. And, and we got two. one expertise, which is one block. One block. All right. So we block so, one of those. And the two expertise will give me two hits. Okay. So we got four, four total. total. So we're going to go four down the chart. So we're going to see that we have two damage, a disarm and a damage. And three more, three damage. more damage. So we're at six, and then you get a choice of strain or pin and a damage. Uh, let's strain them. Okay. So strain is a special condition that uh, if a unit has strain and it makes a move or an attack and it has a strain, it removes the strain and suffers three damage. So it, it really wears you down. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the last important thing to note about being engaged is that characters that are engaged cannot make ranged attacks. 
And if a character that's engaged attempts to make a move, it only can use the short dash tool. Um, so you can kind of lock characters in place and slow them down. And because Ahsoka Tano's here, and you're tied at one to one, because the battle droids are just out, um, you will not take that point, so you would only score one instead of two. Now, would that retain uh, the blue then possession? Yep. Because they had it last turn. Yep, because he has control of it and you didn't steal control of it, he holds on to it. So that happens at the end of the action? End of every turn. Okay. Yep, the end of every player's turn, you check for control. Now, only the active player scores. Okay. So, so Nate isn't scoring anything on this. He just will happen to have starting control of three. Gotcha. Um, so with that, the game would go back and forth for a while. Eventually, one of you would pull out the victory. And we'll just say that the Galactic Republic does pull it out. So so they win. We would flip over the next struggle card. You, as the losing player, would get to choose which map you wanted to use based on the position of all of the characters on the board and which one you thought would start you off at the best foot. Because remember, he wins on his turn, so you get the first turn and you get to score first. Right. Um, we would pick one so we could see like this one, mm -hmm. this one, and this one would become active. Yeah. Um, and at that point, the scoreboard resets, nothing else from your characters or your forces or anything else resets, and you would continue to play on that struggle. If Nate won again, he would become victorious. If you won the struggle, you would you flip over struggle three one. and you go to the third one and it would be like sudden death. Quick now, question. Symbology here on here, I'm assuming this is to select the so, priority. So that is the priority. So in shifting priorities specifically, at the start of your turn, you roll a defense die. Whatever you roll corresponds to that symbol, so this would be fail. So, be so this one over here would be worth two points if you could control it. Okay. And then at the start of the next player's turn, they would roll and the priority token would shift again. Sure. Oh, so that's every turn. Every turn it shifts. Whether you control it or not, it moves. So then having control over as many of those as possible yep. would be key. Would be key so that you could make it easier to make sure you score two. Now, is the third struggle also going to be a choice for the You flip it over. All right, let's flip the third one. And in, in shifting priorities, it is. So you so do we'll get the choice. I would have had to have won. Yep. So then you would then get to choose that next one. So then these would flip over. Nate would choose which one he wanted. Probably these two. Right. Yeah, and sure. then this one. That one back there. And then, again, you would continue on. Okay, very good. So. Now, and it, it may just work out, uh, whoever is picking, do we set it up like that? So if it's this one, yep. I would choose. So yep. it can you swap back and forth. You always the card so that it's facing the person who's picking. Yep. Cool. Awesome. All right. So that's all of the core mechanics of Shatterpoint. The last one that we just want to talk about real quick is the Shatterpoint card. Uh, when you flip a Shatterpoint card, it's, it's a very powerful moment. It is a moment of player choice. So with the Shatterpoint card, it's a wild, which means that you can choose any unit on your strike team to activate, including units that have already gone with their cards in the discard pile or units that haven't gone yet. So it's basically a double uh, that you get to pick. And uh, a lot of the times you'll wind up choosing a primary unit because primary units can do the most damage. But sometimes it can be beneficial to go with a secondary supporting if that's going to eke out the win or give you the ability to control an objective that's going to help you win the struggle. Awesome. All right. This is great. I'm looking so, forward to it. So that, that is the conclusion of kind of the, the demo tutorial of how uh, the different aspects of Shatterpoint kind of come together and work. Obviously, as you continue to dive into it, you know, you start to unlock those synergies and the strategies. And as you kind of see with like the Kalani instance, these tags down here can have a really big impact in terms of how you can maximize your abilities and who can be effective. Some of those things. synergies making like a, a Mando force yep. kind of a thing. Yeah, 100%. So you'll notice like all the Mandalorians have abilities that trigger off of Mandalorians being around them. So the more Mandalorians you take, that's one of the fun things about the core set is that you can start to mix and match these squads to really start to see those synergies and play around with it. Very cool. Awesome, man. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. No problem, guys. Thank you so much for.